what's in it for us? Brothers and sisters, if I preach the gospel, this is no reason for me to boast, for an obligation has been imposed on me, and woe to me if I do not preach it. If I do so willingly, I have a recompense. But if unwillingly, then I have been entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my recompense? That when I preach, I offer the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Although I am free in regard to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so as to win over as many as possible. To the weak I became weak, to win over the weak. I have become all things to all, to save at least some. All this I do for the sake of the gospel, so that I too may have a share in it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 19 and 22 to 23. Perhaps I'm just really selfish and disordered, but I've always been encouraged by passages in Scripture that seem to convey that the disciples thought like me, at least at times. James and John jockey for positions of power, wanting seats at the right and left of Jesus. The twelve wonder aloud which of them is the greatest. Have you ever tried to picture that? But my favorite such passage is when Peter says to Jesus, We've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? I think like them. I think many of us think like them. Like Peter, I often do cost-benefit analysis. This all comes to my mind this week as we listen to Paul's words. Again, we need to remind ourselves what we're hearing at Mass is a very brief excerpt of a much longer letter written by a real man to a real community. And this real man has a single driving goal in his life to make known far and wide that Jesus is the true Lord of the whole universe, that he has defeated the powers of sin, death, and Satan, that God is faithful to the plan he had when he brought everything into being in the first place, and that to know his love and to surrender our lives in grateful response to him is to find true life, true freedom, and true happiness More simply, perhaps we could say Paul is trying to get the two that he loves into each other's arms, God and every single human person. Paul invites the Corinthians to consider a question this week that might be worth our considering as well. Paul acknowledges that those who labor for the gospel have a right to be taken care of For their labors, this right comes from Jesus himself, who had taught, the laborer deserves his pay. See Matthew chapter 10, verse 10. Paul, however, forgoes this and preaches the gospel free of charge. He asks colloquially, what do I get out of this? Well, let's remember quickly what happens to Paul as a result of preaching the gospel. Once he was stoned and left for dead, see Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Three times he was beaten with rods, see Acts chapter 16, verse 22, and 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Another three times he was shipwrecked as he traveled to proclaim Jesus, see Acts chapter 27, verse 41, and 2 Corinthians 11, 25 again. Five times he was whipped with 40 lashes by the Jewish authorities. See 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. And we could go on and on. You'd think he'd give up, but he didn't. Why? Love. Paul was a man who knew himself to be loved intensely by God and who loved intensely. And because he was, and he did, he willingly went through all that he did because he wanted others to come to know that Jesus is Lord 
and is the only one who can make right all that is wrong with the human race in general and with each of us in particular. He's the only one who can deal with sin, deal with death, and deal with the one who prowls around seeking to tear us apart both individually and as a race. So what does Paul get out of preaching the gospel? Well, he gets the grace and the joy of being able to do it. That is, the grace and joy of being a herald of the king. He gets the grace and joy of seeing people set free from the dominion of darkness, despair, and death, and brought into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. See Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. And he gets the grace and joy of seeing people awaken from the nightmare that is life apart from God and being overwhelmed by his personal love for them by name. I would suggest this is worth our consideration because increasingly many of those around us think that to be a Christian is to hate. The church's teaching on sexuality, to take but one example, is a prime place to start. Why does the church hate fill-in-the-blank? And we can do that with a variety of answers. That's the question that's often asked of us. And because increasingly more people think that we hate, to be a disciple of Jesus is to put ourselves in positions where people are going to reject us, call us all sorts of names, cancel us, shun us, and perhaps much worse in times to come. And not just quote-unquote people, but people we are close to, family, friends, co-workers, those we play and travel with. But disciples of Jesus don't hate they love. Okay, sure, some people who call themselves Christians do in fact seem to hate, but perhaps it might be more accurate to say that to believe in the gospel in its entirety, including all that the Lord has revealed about, say, sexuality, is not to hate, because God does not hate. To be a disciple of Jesus is to love, to love God and to love others, even those who hate us. Such demonstrable love was one of the reasons why the early church won over the Roman Empire that was executing them. So through the intercession of St. Paul, may we be overwhelmed anew this week by the love that God has for us by name. May we grow more and more in charity towards others. And may that charity manifest itself in and through us to each person we encounter in the days ahead. Hello, friends. This is Mary Guilfoyle with Acts 29. Thanks so much for listening. If you're interested in knowing more about our mission, check out our website at acts29.org. That's A-C-T-S-X-X-I-X dot org where you can learn more about who we are and what God has called us to do. And while you're there, you can also subscribe to our weekly podcast, You Were Born for This, as well as access the Rescue Project. We'd also like to invite you to connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. And by the way, please pray for us and know of our prayers and our deep gratitude for each and every one of you. We look forward to you tuning in next week. God bless you.